the historic run for the Philadelphia Eagles has come to an end. Courtesy of Taylor Heineke and the Washington Commanders this past Monday night, beating the previously undefeated Birds. They fall to 8-1 and another 8-1 NFC team, the Minnesota Vikings. We're going to be talking about them in depth in this episode. The NFL officials, not just this past week, but this entire season, what's happening? What's going on? Missed calls, terrible calls. These are not just little calls here and there, but these are game-changing, league-altering calls that we want to talk about one by one on a brand new episode of Time to Football. Glad you guys are able to join us. My name is Hassan Khan, your wonderful host. Now, I'm not just the only host on the show. We have Anthony. If you guys are a regular viewer, you are familiar with him. But this week, Anthony, I haven't heard from him. I haven't seen him in like three days, so I hope everything's okay. So um, it's just going to be me solo at this point. Anthony could not join us, and uh, he will be joining us next week. Hopefully, I think. I don't know. If you're watching this, hopefully you're okay. Blink twice if you need help. Uh, but if you guys aren't already subscribed to the channel, subscribe so you can stay up to date when we come out with these podcasts. Every Tuesday night, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for uh, all the NFL debates. And if you guys want to laugh as well, hang out with me, talk about football, join us in the comment section as well as we premiere this. I would love to interact with all of you. If you guys aren't following me on Twitter uh, as of this point, I encourage you guys to hit that follow button at It's Hassan Khan. I love chatting with you guys. I love interacting with everyone throughout the duration of the games on Sundays, on Monday, even Thursday nights, unfortunately. We're watching that. The whole presentation for Prime this season has just been, ugh, hasn't been the best. Hey, Kirk Herbstreit, talking talking about college football? Stop talking about it. Hey, Kirk, it's an NFL broadcast. Start talking about the NFL, not college. You don't have to relate everything to college. Yeah, I'm. Uh, you know, it's kind of reminds me of Georgia. No, 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 no. And how Alabama lost this week. No, 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 no. Hey, shh. Yeah, Tennessee's looking. Shh. The NFL. You're he's well versed in college football. Great communication skills, but dude, it's an NFL broadcast. Talk about the NFL. Jeez. Um. Hey, speaking of Twitter, by the way, uh, I tweeted calling out Maria Taylor. You know, Football Night in America host Maria Taylor, uh, and she uh, co-hosts with Tony Dungy and Chris Sims. Is it Chris Sims or Jason Garrett? I don't, hey, same person. By the way, I'm just getting off track right now, but let's just go ahead and acknowledge that Jason Garrett and Chris Sims are the same person. They look alike. Jason Garrett is just 20 years older. Hey, same person. Who's who? Anyways, Maria Taylor, Football Night in America, this past Sunday before the Chargers and 49ers pregame show. She was down bad for Patrick Peterson. Vikings tradition, went on the road, plane ride back home, put on the chains, go shirtless, Put that ish on. Put that. It was Patrick Peterson this week. Dancing, you know, having a good time. Like, looking like Kirk Thuggins. Maria Taylor sees the body of Patrick Peterson. Pat P is so shredded. She had to make a comment about a six-pack. Had to make a comment. And it's like, okay, what are you doing? Why are you, why are you objectifying a man? But whatever. I'll let it slide. Let's watch the first half of the game. First half happens. Halftime comes up. Show the highlights again. Show Pat P dancing. Put that ish on. Put that ish. Says another comment. I wish that a defensive player does this every week moving forward. Talking about and acknowledging his body. Dude. Why are you objectifying a man? Can you imagine if the roles were switched? If this was a man saying this? Two different comments about a woman's body on air? The outrage. Oh, the outrage. So why is NBC letting Maria Taylor get away with this? As a man, I am offended. I am offended. A little jealous of Patrick Peterson's body, but that's beside the point. You shouldn't be objectifying men. Am I wrong here? Am I wrong? Am I wrong? There's no one over there. Am I wrong? So, you know, on Twitter, I called her out. On Twitter, I, I don't... Listen, I don't do any of this subtweeting or think. No, dude, I will call you out. I don't care. Uh, people that <laughs> have seen this channel before, you know the story with like Tyree Kill, media, Super Bowl Media Day, Entertainment Tonight, I think. No, Extra. It was Extra uh, where this woman cut me in line. I called them out. I posted this video everywhere on every platform, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and I tagged the lady 
that I was talking about. I called them out. I don't care. And she responded on Twitter and said something douchey. But uh, anyways, I'll call you out. So I tagged Maria Taylor on Twitter. She never responded. She's got better things to do, like objectify men. But that's okay. Anyways, leave a comment if you guys picked up on that or if you think that it's okay to objectify men. It's not. Really isn't. Anyways, that Minnesota Vikings-Buffalo Bills game was the game of the week, if not the game of the year. But going into week 10, people thought, hey, that's the game of the week, hands down, on paper. Like, 7-1, and 6-2, and two, potential Super Bowl matchup. This is obviously the best game this week, and it delivered. But Fox would tell you otherwise. Fox NFL said, nah, uh the game of the week is not Vikings versus the Bills, even though we're broadcasting that. It's actually the Cowboys versus the Packers. The 3-6 and six Green Bay Packers. Now, that game went into overtime, ended up being a pretty decent game. But that Vikings-Bills game, going into the game, was the much better matchup. And after the game, blew every other game this season out of the water, hands down, game of the year. But why did Fox think that we would care about the Cowboys and the Packers more? What is up? with Fox's obsession with the Dallas Cowboys. I mean, think about it. When Joe Buck and Troy Aikman were the uh, lead broadcasting crew on Fox, I'm Joe Buck, he's the Hall of Famer, Troy Aikman, always have to call all these Dallas Cowboys games, actually grew a hatred for the Cowboys because they always attach Joe Buck and Troy Aikman to all these Cowboys games. I'm like, I don't want to watch this game. I have nothing against the Cowboys at all, but like for some reason, I'm starting to hate the Cowboys because Fox is just obsessed with the Dallas Cowboys. The first time I noticed this was back in 2010. It was the Dallas Cowboys versus the Minnesota Vikings, both one and three, not having good seasons at all. And they still made it America's game of the week. Why? One and three. That same week, week 6, 2010, the Chicago Bears and Seattle Seahawks played, and they were both 3-1 and one or something like that. But they didn't name that as America's Game of the Week. Instead, they put their lead broadcasting crew with uh, the Dallas Cowboys and the Minnesota Vikings, who were 1-3. and three. Have you noticed this? Am I the only one that's going crazy? Like, what is up with Fox's obsession with the Dallas Cowboys? It was bad this past week with the Minnesota Vikings and Buffalo Bills not being named that game of the week. I don't know. Is it like a deal that they made with Jerry Jones or like the Dallas Cowboys where they broadcast it? Do they think that like most of the nation is going to want to watch that over any other game? Now, I know that it was different time slots. I know that the Cowboys played in 425 and the Minnesota Vikings played at one. But still, like the whole America's Game of the Week label, like why was it not attached to the Vikings and the Bills? Rather, it was given to the Cowboys. I don't know. They seem to have some sort of obsession with the Cowboys. Second, close second is the Green Bay Packers. But the Cowboys, like, they dominate Fox for some reason. Leave your comments down below. I'd I love to hear your thoughts. I, I have no idea why. I, I, I am actually very curious to hearing what your thoughts are. Anyways, let's move on. Let's talk about the Minnesota Vikings. Every season, I make a Super Bowl prediction. And for the last two years, the preseason prediction that I had, at least one of those teams has ended up making the Super Bowl. Two years ago, it was Chiefs-Packers. Chiefs ended up making it. Last year, it was Rams-Titans. The Rams ended up making it, winning the whole thing. This season, my preseason prediction was Chargers-Vikings. Chargers kind of let me down. Not the best team in the AFC. But for the Vikings, Minnesota fans, I'm here to tell you that I have full faith in the Minnesota Vikings not only making the playoffs, not only making the NFC Championship, but I could realistically see them making Super Bowl 57 and hoisting the Lombardi Trophy. The Vikings are for real. And they're for real because of one man. This guy right here, Kevin O'Connell, the head coach, has changed everything with the culture of the Vikings, and that is why I have full faith in Minnesota. He has emphasized Three things in particular, the three C's, collaboration, communication, and consistency with the Vikings. What the heck does that mean? Well, I had the honor of asking 
Kevin O'Connell in an interview. This was prior to Super Bowl 56. He was the offensive coordinator for the Rams. And everybody knew that after he left the Rams, after the Super Bowl, he was going to be named the head coach of the Vikings. Well, prior to him being named the head coach, with that news already being out prior to the Super Bowl, I had the chance to ask him, what are some things that you want to instill in the culture for the Vikings when you do accept that job? Hey, Coach. I uh, appreciate you taking the time. Uh, I wanted to ask you, as you are closing one chapter of your career and opening the next, uh, hopefully on a high note, uh, ending this chapter, I wanted to ask you uh, what life lessons and, and cultural aspects that you learn uh, from your tenure here with the LA Rams that you would like to institute in your future endeavors? Yeah, it's a, that's a big thing, obviously. Um, I think I would start out and just, uh, you know, really talk about the collaboration that goes on and the communication that goes on in our, in our building, player to player, player to coach, coach to player, coach to coach, uh, you know, our staff with the front office, our staff with, I mentioned, the sports performance team, um, our equipment staff, uh, really our operations people, everybody is in lockstep, everybody is in sync because the communication is, is at an elite standard uh, on a daily basis, in season, off season, whatever it may be. And I think that all comes from our head coach and the rest of our leadership with Kevin and Les and Tony um, throughout our whole organization. And it's been set up that in a way uh, by that leadership group to really thrive um, and then obviously getting the right kind of people uh, to come in here and take that and really run with it. Um, I think the consistency of our process is another part of our culture, um, understanding that uh, having foundational points to your culture is, is a great thing. But if it's not a consistent thing that, uh, you know, we hold each other accountable as much as possible in the right kind of ways every single day, um, it really means nothing if it's not uh, a, a consistent thing. So I'd really say those three C's right there of collaborating that goes on, the communication that goes on, and then the consistency to make sure that those two things are always happening uh, to go along with having great people uh, in the walls of this building. So collaboration, collaborating with the front office and the coaching staff, working together, make sure you guys are on the same page. Communication, not just with the front office, not just with the players, but also the coaching staff specifically with Wes Phillips. Because when Ocado came into town, he had a certain office that he wanted to instill. Talk with Phillips, make sure you guys don't butt heads. You collaborate. You communicate, and what does that lead to, according to him? Consistency. You land those three Cs, and oh my goodness, this season, with regards to Monday Night Football, that one blemish, besides that fact, they have been consistent in 2022. Kevin O'Connell has instilled exactly what he has talked about prior to him becoming a head coach, and that is the three Cs. Collaboration, communication, and consistency. He is doing exactly what what he said he was going to do, and that is why I believe that this guy should be NFL Head Coach of the Year. I get it. Pete Carroll has done so much after losing Russell Wilson, has turned him into a winning franchise. Robert Sala, Brian Dable doing so much with so little. Mike McDaniel, the way that he's uh, coaching Tua Tagovailoa in that offense. Even Nick Sirianni starting off 8-0 for the Eagles. I get it. But Kevin O'Connell... 8-1, and one, has taken the same roster that's been around for the last two or three seasons pretty much, hasn't been able to get over that hump of making the postseason, and if they make it, not really doing anything at that point, not being able to close out games. He fixed everything and has instantly turned them into a Super Bowl contender. The offense that he's taken from the Rams that he instilled with Cooper Cup being the main guy and being the main focal point is that instilled that with Justin Jefferson, who a lot of people would say is athletically more talented. So if you just treated Jefferson as the next Cooper Cup, you can do amazing things. And the way that he tore up a very stout Bills defense shows that Kevin O'Connell's offense is the real deal. That he has made them instantly a team to be scared to face. It doesn't matter if you have one of the better defenses in the NFL. They can put up points. They can put up yards. Kevin O'Connell would be my pick of NFL Head Coach of the Year. Looking at the Vikings schedule remaining. The Dallas Cowboys, the Patriots, Jets, Lions, Colts, Giants, Packers, Bears, Pretty tough defenses, but like we mentioned, it doesn't really matter. The way they showed up against the Bills doesn't really matter. They could easily win four of these next eight games or so and could go 12-5. and five. 
I know that they're competing for that number one seed in the NFC, try to get that first round by, but they're going to be making the postseason. And I believe wholeheartedly inside of me, Minnesota fans, you should be excited that the Vikings are going to make a deep run in the postseason. Can they compete with the Philadelphia Eagles? Can they have that rematch against the Eagles in like the 2017 NFC Championship game? Don't know, but I'm excited to find out. Leave your comments down below. I'd love to hear your thoughts about the Minnesota Vikings. Moving on uh, to a new topic. I just briefly want to talk about this, about the missed calls that have been happening across the NFL this season. Like the NFL officiating crews have just been not the best. I I mean, it really started the season when Grady Jarrett was called on that roughing the passer penalty and it kind of cost the Falcons that game. Potential win, I should say. We don't know for sure if they're going to win. And then since then, it's just been kind of snowballing and it's just not really been looking up for uh, NFL fans and for this officiating crew. Like so many missed calls and specifically the missed calls this past week were just insane. Let me just go ahead and talk about it first with that Vikings and Bills game. I'm pretty sure you guys, if you're on Twitter, you already saw that the the picture of the 12 men on the field. Uh, and this was in a crucial moment, like when the Vikings had to score uh, to, to beat the Bills. And they missed that. They missed that 12 uh, men on the field call. Well, anyways, a little bit later on, on that same drive, when they were goal to go, the Bills' defense is offsides on this quarterback sneak, one of the quarterback sneaks that Kirk Cousins had to try to sneak it into the end zone and put the Vikings up. Uh, NFL officiating crew just ended up missing that one. And then you have the Gabriel Davis catch. Now, that was an overtime, and uh, it put the Bills in a pretty good position to uh, score a field goal, maybe even a game-winning touchdown as well. But they didn't even take the time to review it. Like, they said it, Dean Blandino for Fox said it as well. Like, this should have gone to New York. They should have reviewed it. They should have overturned that catch, but they let it stand. So that is three calls right there in just that one game. Well, there's another game, Monday Night Football, Philadelphia Eagles, Versus Washington Commanders, this was critical because it cost the Eagles their undefeated season. Now, I don't want to discredit, by the way, uh, the Washington Commanders. Like, unlike the the Bills, like the calls didn't really affect the game and the outcome because the Vikings ended up winning anyways. But in this game, maybe you could argue that if the calls went the other way uh, or if these calls didn't happen, then maybe the Eagles would still be undefeated. But I don't want to discredit Heineke and the commanders, and what they've done. There was a missed face mask call on Dallas Goddard. Like, Goddard fumbled the ball. There's no question about that. He fumbled it. Okay, that's that's on Goddard. But his face mask was pulled, and to make matters worse, we learned that Dallas Goddard has a shoulder injury and is going to be missing some time. So we don't know for sure if, like, that face mask was, like, if he didn't get his face pulled, that shoulder injury wouldn't have happened. Easy to believe that maybe it did contribute to him missing some time. So not only is that going to be a turnover and leading the commanders to end up eventually winning the game. But their star tight end is now going to be missing a few weeks and they got nothing out of it. The Eagles did it. So that was a missed call and you know, all turnovers are reviewed. So I can't imagine the NFL officiating crew seeing this replay and they didn't throw the flag, but they know, they know in the back of their heads Oh my gosh, like this is uh, this is kind of cringy. Like I just don't feel good about this. Like I have to watch them pull the face mask. We didn't throw the call or we didn't throw the flag on this. I have to watch this over and over, even though I know it's a missed call. Like, I mean, that, that must be brutal for them. And then the last play I want to talk about, Taylor Heineke on third and long, passing the ball, running out the clock, doesn't see anyone open. So he smartly takes a knee. Now that's a good decision on Heineke's part. But Brandon Graham, like, he didn't have malicious intent. Uh, some people say it's 50-50, like, you should have thrown a flag. That is rough in the passer. Some people say it wasn't. Uh, I personally don't believe it was malicious intent. I don't think you should have thrown the flag. I think it was just like, hey, I got so much going on. Offensive tackle, I got to go around him. I don't see anyone around him. Like, one of my teammates to touch him. He might have slipped as well if you look in fast motion. Uh, I just got to go ahead and run him and make sure I touch him. So, like, if you're running fast... Uh, make sure he doesn't get up. It's just so hard to like make that split decision to kind of like back off, which you can kind of see him doing to try to avoid that penalty. Uh, but anyways, I understand if you think it is roughing the passer. I understand if you don't think it is. That one's 50-50. But it kind of plays into the point of officials making these questionable calls 
that have been costing a lot of teams NFL games. And at, at a certain point, you're like, what the heck? Like, NFL, what, do, what can we do at this point? Us as fans, we can't do anything, right? I mean, you could make a complaint to customer service. Hey, by the way, NFL Plus customer service is terrible. It sucks. It sucks. I'm not able to log in. I paid for it. I'm, I'm the dumbass that paid for it. I know. It's pointless. Uh, but I paid for it, and I can't even log in. And so I've been trying to reach out to them. They don't have a customer service number. Anyways, yeah, go through the customer service of the uh, NFL officiating. Leave a complaint. They're not going to read it. That's my point. Uh, so the customer service of the NFL sucks. You can't li- really leave a complaint. All you can do is just kind of complain on social media about it. And it's just accountability at that point from the NFL on the officiating crew. It's like, what can they really do at this point? Like with these missed calls, terrible calls, uh, and with the NFL coming out after games and saying like, yeah, that shouldn't have been called roughing the passer. Yeah, that shouldn't have been called hold- holding. That shouldn't have been called defensive pass interference. Saying things like that and actually admitting the mistake and the officials not really owning up to it, like no like accountability or anything like that. Like, what are we doing here? Like, I, I feel wholeheartedly there should be accountability taken account for, but... I mean, nothing's really changed at this point. So it's crazy to think like how, you know, teams would be if some of these calls didn't go in a certain way. Like maybe the Eagles would still be undefeated. Maybe the Falcons would be leading the NFC South because like Grady Jarrett roughing the pass penalty. We don't know. But just words to think on. So uh, leave your thoughts below on the uh, NFL officiating crew. I'd love to hear your thoughts and your comments. I'd love to see everybody ripping into them because I'm one of those people that's like, Calls happen all the time, missed calls, like people don't call holding. If you want to call holding all the time and get it 100% accurate, there would be holding on every single play, almost every play in the NFL. They don't do that, right? So there's a lot of missed calls. But a lot of these that I just mentioned are game-altering calls, and they should be addressed. There should be accountability for it. Leave your thoughts in your comments down below. The last thing that I want to talk about, NFL Week 11 preview. So we go through every game that happens in Week 11. We just kind of give you our thoughts, kind of give you uh, our prediction on who we think is going to win as well. So the first game, uh, Thursday Night Football, Tennessee Titans versus Green Bay Packers. The Titans are looking good, leading the AFC South. The Green Bay Packers upset victory against the Dallas Cowboys home at Lambeau Field. They are home for this one as well. Uh, I'm going to go with the Titans in this one. I am going with Tennessee. I think people just credit or overlook the Tennessee Titans. Their defense is good. Their run defense is great. And pretty much like <laughs> Aaron Jones and A.J. Dillon as the offense for the Green Bay Packers at this point. And if your run def- defense is stout enough to stop them, then it's going to be the Titans win uh, for this weekend. Going into Sunday, Chicago Bears versus Atlanta Falcons. The Bears have been looking great. They are the first team in NFL history to put up 29 points at least in the last two games and win or lose those two games. So, It's looking bad for the Bears as far as that goes. But, I I mean, as far as, like, Justin Fields and how much he's improved and how great he looks, like, this offense is getting things rolling. That's bad news for a Falcons team that still doesn't have Casey Hayward, doesn't have A.J. Terrell. They're giving up a lot of points and a lot of yards on defense. Unfortunately, I am going with the Chicago Bears. I say unfortunately because I'm a Falcons fan, but I'm going to have to ride with the Bears. Uh, Like, Justin Fields coming back to his hometown. uh, Grew up in uh, Kennesaw. And I think... He's going to do uh, amazing things again for the Chicago Bears versus the Falcons. The Carolina Panthers versus the Baltimore Ravens. The Panthers beat the Falcons on Thursday night football. The Ravens are coming off their bye week, hopefully having Mark Andrews and Gus Edwards back healthy. And because of that, I'm going with the Ravens in this matchup. Panthers are going back to Baker Mayfield. And again, you can expect the offense to not really get anything going. Deontay Foreman looks great. That's awesome. But... I mean, other than that, the Ravens defense, I know that they've given up a lot of yards so far this season, but in the last few weeks, especially their defense has gotten better. Uh, The Cleveland Browns versus the Buffalo Bills. The Browns uh, are coming off of a loss against the Miami Dolphins, and then the Bills are coming off a loss as well. They need a rebound uh, in this game. I think I got the Bills in this one. Now, this is one of the last one or two weeks of Jacoby Brissett starting in this game, and then you're going to have Deshaun Watson coming back. Uh, But... Yeah, I'm going to be going with the Bills in this game. Washington Commanders versus Houston Texans. Uh, Commanders surprised everyone. Like, looked amazing against the Philadelphia Eagles. And then the Houston Texans uh, just, I mean, doesn't (laughs) continues to look really bad. But Brandon Cooks is back. 
So that's good news for them as well. Uh, Lovey Smith not making a quarterback change. He was asked about it. He said, it's not time. And I agree with him. Like at this point, what do you, what can you do? Like Kyle Allen is the backup. What, what are you going to see out of Kyle Allen? It's not like you're seeing anyone uh, that's like your future, you know? So just stick out with Davis Mills, see what he's got. And uh, I, mean, I mean, it's looking like they're probably going to go quarterback and free agency or the draft. Anyways, with all that said, I'm going with the Commanders. I think it's going to be a big game uh, for Antonio Gibson and Brian Robinson. The Philadelphia Eagles versus the Indianapolis Colts. The Eagles now 8-1 and one, want to rebound after losing to the Washington Commanders. The Colts, on the other hand, won their first game with Jeff Saturday as the head coach. Let me talk about Coach Saturday here real quick. I'm a big fan of Jeff Saturday. Uh, the city that I grew up in, Decula, Georgia, 10 minutes uh, from where we filmed the show, he, he coached at. Hebron Christian Academy. The only head coaching experience that he has is a school 10 minutes down the road. Uh, so he grew up in this community and uh, I've spoken to a lot of people that know him personally. And uh, it sounds like he's a very, very great guy. I haven't had the chance to meet him uh, personally, but uh, I know a lot of people uh, within that circle that he has. And uh, they say that he's, he's a very good guy. So I love coach Saturday. Um, and the leadership that he's brought with the Colts, changing the culture, naming Matt Ryan the starter. Like, he's been doing a great job. Like, if you help the Colts win, you're doing your job. Like, that's that's all that matters. Uh, I've been on the boat of saying, hey, let's just give it a chance. John Lynch didn't have any general manager experience, like, and he's done wonders for the 49ers, like, help them get to the Super Bowl. Jeff Saturday, let's just see what he does. And he's, so far, a winner. But now I'm seeing a lot of people saying, Oh, I told you so, or uh, not not to me specifically. I've been like really dead even in the middle, but like online, like Jim Irsay actually tweeting out saying like, man, we had a lot of haters. Uh, I told you so, like, you know, whatever, suck it. And it's like, hey, he could still be winning, but this does not discredit the fact that this is still not a great hire. Like he could win five five more games this season and it's still not a great hire. It's not. Because what he's bringing into the culture of the Colts is leadership, naming Matt Ryan the starter. Like, what he's done is help the Colts have a locker room shift and win games. That's awesome. But he's pretty much just a figurehead. Like, the offensive coordinator, 30-year-old offensive coordinator calling his calling plays in his first NFL game should be given more credit for what he's done uh, in this victory against the Raiders. You can still get the leadership aspect of Jeff Saturday. Players coach really motivates you. And another guy that has NFL coaching experience that has been around for a few years, 10, 15, 20 years, same locker room leadership, players coach kind of guy. You can get that and someone else as an interim head coach. So listen, I'm rooting for Saturday. I really am. I hope he goes uh, 7-0, however many more games are left. I hope that happens. I really do. But like, let's just kind of tone down a bit on like the, oh, I told you like, oh, there's so many haters. Like I told you this is going to work out. Like it just takes, it's it's not, it's not the best hire. It's just not. And and I'd be very, very surprised if uh, he's a head coach moving forward going into 2023. But congratulations on the victory. I hope it happens. I really do. Uh, I'm rooting for him because like I said, this community, he, he did a lot for this community. The New York Jets versus the New England Patriots. Uh, the Jets lost to the Patriots the last time uh, these two teams faced, but both are coming off their bye week. Both had an extra week to prepare. I'm still going with the Patriots. I think the Patriots are going to sweep the Jets, and they advance to 6-4. and four. The Los Angeles Rams versus the New Orleans Saints. The Saints are still going through a quarterback conundrum process. They still don't know who the quarterback is. Uh, Dennis Allen at first said, no, we're sticking with Andy Dalton. Now they're saying, actually, we're weighing all the – uh, ups and downs and still going through the process. We don't know who's going to be the quarterback, uh, him or Jameis Winston. Uh, but the Los Angeles Rams have lost Cooper Cup, Matthew Stafford. He's been brutal without uh, targeting Cooper Cup. So it's going to be really, really bad uh, for the Rams offense moving forward. They still don't have a run game. Uh, maybe Kyron Williams does something. But uh, in this game, I am going to go with the upset. Nah, I'm going to go with the Rams. I'm going to stick with the Rams on this one. Uh, the Saints are still going through a lot. The Detroit Lions versus the New York Giants. The Lions won two games in a row so far. The Giants coming off a big victory against the Houston Texans. I am going to go 
with the Giants in this one, I, the defense of the Detroit Lions, man, it's still bad. Uh, Darius Slayton seems like he's the leading receiver for the Giants. Saquon Barkley, though, it, that's all you need. Like, that's been the the bread and butter for the Giants. That's why they've been able to have uh, so much success is because of the run game on offense and their defense really creating uh, a lot of good opportunities. So I'm going to go with the Giants. Las Vegas Raiders versus the Denver Broncos. Last time these two teams faced, the Broncos won. Uh, the Raiders are now visiting the Broncos. Derek Carr, very emotional. After dropping to 2-7, and seven, the Broncos, I mean, still don't look good after having a whole bye week to prepare for the Tennessee Titans. Uh, but the Raiders' defense doesn't really do much, so I am going to go with the Broncos in this one. Uh, it's going to be really bad for the Raiders. I know that Darren Waller, by the way, is out uh, with some injuries, but you could see them shutting him down for the remainder of the season. I know that he could be coming back like week 14, week 15 or something, uh, but they might just be like, hey, let's just go ahead and call it a season and not bring you back. Uh, the Dallas Cowboys versus the Minnesota Vikings. Uh, this should be the game of the week, as we got it displayed on the TV right behind us. Uh, the Cowboys lost to, uh, <laughs> yeah, if you tune into the beginning of the show, game of the week, Dallas Cowboys. This finally makes sense because the records say it should be game of the week. This is how you name the game of the week, America's game of the week, by the way, Fox. Uh, but the Cowboys uh, are coming off a loss to the Green Bay Packers. Minnesota Vikings are coming off a big victory against the Buffalo Bills. I'm going to continue to roll with the Vikings. I just put my heart and soul out there with the Vikings earlier in the show. So I'm going to continue with the Vikings. I believe that they win this and advance to 9-1. and one. The Cincinnati Bengals versus the Pittsburgh Steelers. The Bengals coming off their bye week. Uh, still Jamar Chase less because Zach Taylor came out and said, can't give you an update right now, but recovery seems like it's going well. So that pretty much tells you, yeah, he's pretty, pretty much not going to be playing this week. Uh, but for the Pittsburgh Steelers, they won against the New Orleans Saints. Kenny Pickett having a rushing touchdown in there as well. So I'm going to go with uh, the Bengals on this one. I think they have an extra week to prepare. I like the Bengals to win this matchup. The Kansas City Chiefs versus the Los Angeles Chargers, Sunday Night Football. Uh, this was flexed into the Sunday Night Football spot. The Chargers, it's not looking good for them. For the Chiefs, I mean, uh, Clyde edwards layer seems like he's out. Isaiah Pacheco is a starting uh, running back moving forward. Uh, I'm going to go with one upset does have to happen, right, in the NFL. Upsets happen all the time. So I'm going to go with the Chargers. I am. Like, it was close the last time these two teams faced where uh, Justin Herbert had that heroic, like, broken cartilage and his ribs coming back and almost winning the game. I feel like this is the time that they actually pull it off. So I'm going to go with the Chargers to win this game. And then Monday Night Football, San Francisco 49ers versus the Arizona Cardinals uh, and Mexico. Uh, I'm going to go with the 49ers in this one. Man, they just look scary. Ever since this defense is starting to get back their – their injured players and the trade with Christian McCaffrey or for Christian McCaffrey, they just have just so much depth on offense. And now just add in Elijah Mitchell coming back. Like this running back room is crazy to the fact that they didn't really need Debo this past weekend on Sunday night football against the chargers. Hey, like, you know, you have an extra player in reserve that you can use that you can utilize. That's an all pro. And in the instance that, McCaffrey were to go down with injury or they were to uh, take out George Kittle and the game plan or things like that. Like they have so many weapons that can spread the ball to. So, uh, and we still don't know the status of Kyler Murray, like still deal dealing with uh, a hamstring injury. He's day to day. Uh, we don't know what he's going through right now. So uh, I encourage you guys to uh, pick the 49ers in your uh, weekly picks. If you guys play on any sort of parlays or anything like that. Uh, but that is your week 11 preview going through each game. Uh, but that's going to do it for this episode of Time to Football. I, again, encourage you guys to give me a follow on Twitter, at It's Hassan Khan. I love to interact with you guys, chatting with the viewers. You guys uh, are just awesome, and um, I can't thank you enough for continuing to show your support uh, for this channel. Make sure you guys hit that subscribe button as well. I want you guys to get up to date with all the stuff that we come out with throughout the duration of the week, including this podcast and this show that comes out every Tuesday uh, evening, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, with all that said, thank you guys so much for watching this episode, and I'll see you next week. Take care. <laughs>